Welcome back, everybody, to episode three of the Card Shatter with Refractor Jones and Bobbles and Ball Cards. Refractor, sir, I hope you are doing well. Um, you left us on a great topic to flow right into episode three on. And that was when we were discussing the Ken Griffey Jr. And you mentioned that you had 50 raw copies and um, just why you hadn't graded them. And also you brought up a little teaser of you called it a five-year plan. Can you uh, brief us a little bit on what that five-year plan is and maybe touch on why um, you said you owned three PSA 10 copies of a the 89 Upper Deck Griffey, but you also mentioned you had 50 other raw copies that each had their own little personality and those you have kept raw. So what, what's the five-year plan? So the, the five-year plan for me, and this is how I've always approached collecting in general. If I liked a guy or, a, you know, a set or, or whatever it is, just cards in general, I, I always look at it if at it at as a five-year plan because i don't want to grade that card i don't want to you know i i, I don't want to sell that card i want to try to buy that card because one i like the card so if my five-year plan is going to work and in order for it to work i need to go out and go to shows go on ebay go to com c you know go everywhere that i can to to find these certain things that i do want and just buy them and put them in my collection in five years, there's maturity, there's time. You understand, you know whether this this person or the set has matured enough in the hobby to be recognized as something that will be very collectible down the road. So I look at it as I'm saving a ton of money by not grading the, the items right away as soon as they come out of a pack, which most people do now. They'll crack it, penny sleeve it, and you know, it's a way to, to grading. And for me, I, you're, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot there because eh, let's just say out of 10 guys, how many of those guys are going to succeed Two, If even that, I mean, there's going to be mid grade stars, you know, there'll, there'll be guys there that'll be recognized as stars, but are they going to hold that Supreme collector value to everyone else? You know, we, in, in our generation, we had star players, but they're basically common players now. You know, they're not they're not anything of significant value. So, right. You know. I I alluded to it. I can't remember if it was episode one or two, um, but co growing up, you know, and obviously, you know, I was born in 1980. So the 80s and 90s were my childhood collecting years. But I remember distinctly. I, you know, I'm obviously a big Griffey fan, but one of the players I liked because, you know, the Nationals weren't in existence in the 80s and 90s. Um, sure they were. So, they were the Expos. Well, you know what I mean, locally for me <laughs> in, in Northern Virginia. We had Baltimore. Um, and a player that I really liked, believe it or not, wasn't, and, and I respected Cal Ripken Jr., but the player I'm talking about was Mike Musina. I love mm -hmm. Mike Mussina uh, playing. You, you talked about youth baseball. Um, I, I, you know, my my youth baseball league didn't like assign us professional team names, but pitching, I always wanted to figure out how Mike Mussina threw that knuckle curve. And so I always looked at Mussina. And just as you mentioned, many players from our time were great players. Mussina is a Hall of Famer, but his rookie card is not much at all well, <laughs> you know for pennies on a dollar <laughs> right <laughs> you know so i i i think it's a great point especially in today's in, in today's like mindset and, and we you know we talked about this where the cards are you know they're essentially almost not even touching air anymore like mm -hmm. they're sealed in these these packs uh, these foil packs most of the time and they are being pulled, sleeved, card savored, shipped, you know, mm -hmm. and, and as somebody that 
you know, I, I love grading. Obviously, we do group, you know, group bulk submissions. I think grading is a wonderful aspect to the hobby. But I also like that thought process of you and you're you're spot on here because I, I think right now, especially today, a lot of people are getting hyper focused on quarterbacks in football. And you had mm -hmm. a, a big strong quarterback draft in 2020, and then you had a strong quarterback draft in 2021. But so far, you know. Herbert's looked decent. Burrow lost, made it, but lost the Super Bowl. But we've already seen this year, I believe, Zach Wilson's out with like something with his knee or something like that. And we don't know if any of these guys are going to ever go anywhere. I did a, a video on the other channel uh, showing like the history over the past, well, I don't even remember how many years it was, but most of the top, you know, top quarterbacks that were drafted, they've never even sniffed the Super Bowl. So I think it's a great uh, a great thought process there to to kind of just sit back and watch. And as you just mentioned, it saves you a lot of money. Um, let's be real, grading has gotten expensive today. You know, hopefully that adjusts when things start flowing again in a more natural fashion. But currently, and over the past two years especially, grading has gotten expensive. So. You know, someone in your five-year plan aspect, let's say you sat down and cracked a pack of, you know, 2020 Prism or whatever. Yuck. And you hit, well, I'm just saying, uh, hypothetically a popular product. But let's say you pulled, and I know uh, I know you're not happy about this, but I I'm going to throw him out there. Let's say you No, no LeBron. Nope, oh, okay. a Tua. Okay. okay. A Tua. Yeah. A Tua. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you were sour that your Dolphins – Draft didn't take her instead of yeah you, you were sour about that but as a yeah. dolphins fan right right correct a, a, a tua you pulled up a, a prism tua so your mind you're gonna sit on that and give tua until 2025 to see if he can pan out to be a decent or great nfl quarterback right that that's your five-year goal yeah, if, if if I wanted to hold Tua, but I mean, Tua wouldn't be somebody that I would hold. I would honestly just get rid of it. You know, I would trade it off to get whatever else I can get. But exactly what you're saying it is my way of of the grading aspect of, of the game for me. I, I look at things at a five-year plan. So I'll buy as much as I can of that favorite guy that I have. I'm only into it for minimal amount of money. I'm not into it for grading fees. It can go into a top loader. It can sit in a box. It can wait. In five years, I've got enough of history to show what he has done in his current career and how much longer he's going to be able to project in his future career. And and then after that five-year plan, I'll start grading those, those cards if he's a superstar. If he's not, then there's really no need. Okay. So let's take it out of football. And let's go into a sport that gets a little bit more complicated. And there's something that recently happened on a team that you're very, that hits very close to home for you. Um, baseball. Now, does your five-year plan, now obviously in football, you're going, and even basketball, that five years is going to be based off of either draft, you know, five years from draft or five years from starting aspect. In baseball, though, there's guys that could be in the minors for five years. Are you basing baseball off of MLB debut time point, or is it draft time point? Do you say, okay, five years from the time they hit double A? Uh, what, what's your five-year window in baseball? The reason I bring this up is I know Padres are very close to home for you, and you know, Tatis is a guy that initially – outside of the injuries was trajecting to look like a superstar in five years, but had a little bit of issue come up. Um, so explain a little bit more of your thought process on the baseball side. Well, for, for baseball, for me, it's, it's really the same thing. You know, uh, I look at it, the minor league level for me is pure enjoyment. So yes, there's cards of these guys while they're in the minor leagues. But I, I don't treat it any different from um, from them being in the minor leagues to the major leagues. It, eventually, they're going to get there. If they do, they do. If they don't, they don't. 
but I, I'm still going to buy their stuff if I feel that they have the potential or if I like that guy, you know, and if I follow that guy and working in a professional clubhouse, you know, you get to learn and understand, you know, the makeup of these guys. So, you know, there's, there's certain guys that I, I can recall that didn't have that big notoriety that were like superstars, but they became very good utility players or they became very good major league ball players because they had it in them. And, and of course that's where that five-year window comes in where, you know, you, you can start buying all this stuff and you can start holding it and you're not going to get hurt where you get hurt is when you start spending all that money in grading everything all up front and you're, you're actually, you know, you're more of a detriment to your, your collection than anyone else could ever be by just going out and start grading everything. Enjoy your cards, buy, buy other cards, buy more of that. You know? So, to, and to your point, just to reiterate, you do, if you have like a guy you like, um, and, and we'll just use Tatis as an example. Um, you said that y- you associate and connect the minor leagues to either they're going to make it or they're not. So if there's a guy that catches your eye or what have you, you're buying him or you're going to start buying him even before the bigs, but then open him into that, that five years starting then or waiting until he actually hits the bigs. No, wait, wait till he hits the major league level, you know, because okay. then, then you're going to get a full body's worth of work, you know, because the minor league level is, is totally different. It's just a total different beast. You know, it's, it's more laid back, you know, guys are there getting, getting their instructions in and getting their stuff done and, and just working their way to, to the major leagues. Once you're there at the major league level, you know, it, it's, it's just a total different beast, you know, that's, a lot of people, you know, don't understand why a lot of these guys are not very active with fans and because they're just so, in, you know, dedicated to their craft and they do what they do. Not that I agree with it. You know, I, I believe there should be more time given to, to kids and, and to fans and that type of stuff. But a lot of these guys are, are just so focused on what they're doing. They don't want any other outside distraction. So... You know, for, for me to, to look at a guy at the minor league level, I, I see two things. One, I, I see progression as, as a player. But two, I, I get to see them before they unfortunately get to the major, major league level and they don't have time for, you know, the general fan anymore. So you mentioned something um, about guys that you had seen that weren't they, – they didn't have that – that it factor about them. And one thing like a lot of people rely a a lot on, and there are so many of them coming out now, um, but these uh, top prospect lists, right. Of Mm -hmm. of these guys in the majors and they're ranking them and you got the baseball America list and you got the, I I don't know. I'm I'm just throwing names out there, but like the, the, the baseball America list, ESPN list, the, you might have a USA today list, like all of these different prospect lists, right. And I think a lot of people, and I hear it more and more, a lot of people like are associating those lists to hyping those players up because obviously, you know, those lists are made off of professional scouts and everything. And I think you you hit something spot on there where a game a guy might not have been like on a radar, but became a really great major league player because he kind of wanted that. And somebody that I've witnessed with that is Soto. You know, as a Nationals fan, I, like, obviously was keeping up with their prospects and the team itself and everything else. Soto was not on these prospecting radars. Like, people don't understand. It actually, the way Juan Soto played out to become Juan Soto was all by happenstance chance. Like it shouldn't, if somebody ever goes back and writes a story about Juan Soto, it would be very interesting because first of all, Victor Robles was the prospect that was the five tool guy, the one that had that it factor, you know, and Victor was great 
in the minor leagues. Like I went and watched him at Potomac all the time. He was great. Juan Soto was the kid that the Nationals actually signed because they heard him hitting baseballs in the uh, the batting cage, and they heard the pop coming off the bat. And so they went over there and talked to him and told the other scouts that they had already signed the kid because I believe it was the Diamondbacks and I can't remember the other team. There was a couple of teams come over to watch one, and they were like, oh, we already got him locked up. But they hadn't. They, they actually were just watching him, but they didn't want nobody else to have that attention. Right. But then, you know, there was Carter Keboom. Um, you had Luis Garcia. Like, it, it's interesting to know. I am not a professional baseball scout. But if you go to these games and you watch these players and you, you talk, you, you said the word, that it factor, you can see in some of these guys, do they want it? Do they have it or are they just a top name kind of cocky on the list? And they may have talent, but that talent may not carry over to the big leagues. And I'll tell you, you know, you can ask the missus this. The first time I watched Carter Keboom, I was like, I don't really think he's that good. He just didn't look like he had it. And he's mm-hmm. never panned out in the bigs, but yet he was a top prospect. And I think people do get, caught up in these lists because, well, they're the scouts. They know everything. And these are the guys that were drafted high. Same way in football, just because you were a first pick. Jamarcus Russell was a first pick. Ryan Leaf was a first pick. Didn't mean they were the best player in that draft. You know, so I think it's very smart with what you're saying, especially today, um, to wait five years. And I'm curious if you could just, elaborate a little bit like if you were going today and and we'll throw herbert out there i won't mess with you on tua but uh, we'll throw herbert out there if you were going to go buy a herbert or or buy herbert's you know to sit on what are like what are you going to go after for him do you stick with the basic stuff do you go into all these different color and maybe it's a bad thing because i know you're not the highest fan of panini um, but only, just, be, only because of overproduction, because they, right. you know, they the the presses are not going to stop. Even when they're they're done creating, you know, sports cards, they're they're still going to be the, the presses are still going to be rolling at Panini. I mean, they 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 just don't stop. So that's okay. I'm not a that's why I'm not a fan of of, of Panini. At, you know, and and plus they they steal everything, everything. Well, I think they have tops. Is, I think Tops is running the presses a, a lot as well, but we'll go with Tops. We'll go with Tops. Let's say, okay. um, let, let, let's go with Julio Rodriguez right now. Would you just be sticking to his Tops? Like, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be an update. Would you be stashing his update rookies? Would you go for the gold, like the Tops gold out of, you know, serial numbered out of 2022? Uh, would you go for something more? elaborate like uh, a definitive or a tops dynasty would you go for a mix of everything do you have something that you stick to no or, I, or is it I, just the I, basics i i would definitely do a, a, a mix you know whatever opportunity presented itself to be able to purchase that that said player then you know i i would but i would target being that it's you know tops a tops line product i would chase the the refractor versions and and sit you know, on those and, and be happy and content with those. You know, I, if you're going to just have Bowman paper, you know what Bowman paper is. It's just great. It's, it's filler Bowman paper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> so yeah, those are great, but you know, to me, I, I'm, I'm going to want stuff that's either serial numbered to, you know, under, under a hundred, you know, that's, that's where I want to buy. And, and, and if I'm going to be buying that stuff, I have to be aware that, hey, am I buying at, at his peak, at his at his current peak and his current height, or am did I get into it early enough to to buy it just because I like the cards in general, which where I get the advantage of because I do a lot of refractors. So with me buying a lot of refractors in volume, you know, there's there's plenty of guys that have that have come through systems that that people had no idea was gonna be any good and Luckily enough, because I buy refractors in bulk, I go back and I start searching through things. 
and I'll have three, four, maybe five of that said player. And of course, I, I reap the rewards of that. So, so here, this might be a tricky question to answer. Over the past two years, we have seen uh, people like to allude to it as FOMO. Okay. Now, if we were going to a guy like Julio Rodriguez, okay, mm -hmm. and we're sitting here now, his, his rookies are in 2022. Topps Chrome isn't out yet. Uh, I don't know if he's going to be in regular Chrome or if he'll be an update. Probably, be but update. you mentioned you you mentioned the refractor. We have come to see that the 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 general feel on values to purchase cards right now it's almost like people are buying at a ceiling and praying that the cards don't decline in value with mm -hmm. your five-year plan would that be have you had to adjust that take and say okay i'm not buying him right now but i am putting him on my radar and i will see if once the new shininess wears off of him in three years, if his price comes down, when more hits the market, or are you going out and saying, no, I feel firm on this guy. I'm going to buy him now. I'm going to buy any of them I can right now. And I'm just going to ride the wave for five years. Have you had to adjust that strategy? Because before you could buy a guy and he would come out essentially at a lower value. And then as you know, he progressed along, the value would increase. So you wanted to get in on it early. Now it's almost like the hobby has came to where you want to wait it out a little bit and let the, the shininess of the new toy wear off and then go into that guy that you think has a bright future. Have you had to change that buying strategy at all? Mm, yes and no. I mean, you know, a, a lot of that's all speculation because everyone speculates, oh, well, this guy's going to be this, this guy's going to be this, you know? So I let people worry about that and let them go crazy over that kind of stuff. And I just move on to the next guy, you know, and, and I will keep that guy on my radar. But again, I will buy his stuff when it presents itself at the right price. For me, as a, a collector that I am, I, I buy major collections. You know that I, I, I'll travel the country and, and go buy collections anywhere. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a cardboard junkie. So will I see, uh, you know, 100 Julio Rodriguez in, in somebody's collection? Yep. You know, will I see five in somebody's collection? Yep. But it just depends on whether I want to pay X amount of dollars for that, that collection in general, whether it's going to be financially feasible for me for one and financially smart to actually purchase a guy who, you know, could just fall off the radar in the next year or two. So that's why right. I, I play that five-year plan. I, you know, and and I, that's, that's kind of why I like, I had, I asked that question because again, you know, before you could say, all right, I like the makeup of this kid. You could follow him, looked at his minor league statistics. He makes his debut. There might be a little bit of hype on him for a minute, but usually it was a, a realistic, like, all right, you know, he's coming into the league and, you know, even a hype inflated, he, he I, I'm going to use Juan Soto as an example. I was buying Juan Soto rookie cards during the 2019 World Series, his Topps Chrome updates and his Topps update rookie cards. Mm -hmm. I was buying them for $15, you know. This yeah. is during the World Series which Soto had already played his rookie year out and they were then in 2019, his second year and in the world series and they were 15 bucks. I actually had this discussion and everything because Julio Rodriguez has a tops uh, bonus variation card, very similar to 2018 uh, tops complete sets where they inserted um, the Ronald Acuna and Gleyber Torres, which had the same image as their 2018 Tops update cards. Mm -hmm. And folks, if they looked back on those two cards and used those as examples, would see that those two cards do not carry a premium value because everybody knew they were in every complete set. You just went and purchased the set. You got a guaranteed 
Acuna, Gleyber Torres, you know, even though it was a variation, it, it wasn't rare. It wasn't hard to get. And then these 2022 sets came out and people I was seeing, like people were like posting all over Facebook about these sets. And I'm like, wait, y'all are paying 20 to $30 for this Julio Rodriguez. So I, it got me playing with some math and I'm like, wait a second. They probably printed like, I, I can't remember exactly. I think I estimated 550,000 complete sets, potentially, maybe more. That was being a modest number. And I was like, so a card that has over a half a million copies printed, people are buying raw right now for 20, 30 bucks. Do you know that's gonna become like a 50 cent card or a dollar card, you know? And so that that's why I was curious because it's like from the way things used to be to the way things are today, you almost have to adjust and, and learn because on your five-year plan, you might be able to write Julio down as a player. All right, in five years, he might get set in my grading pile. But today, his value is more than I'm willing to, and I like to call it the cost to obtain. Sure. And his cost to obtain might be too high right now. But we both know that once more hit the market, and again, supply demand, likely in like, two years unless he becomes ungodly just amazing his cards are likely going to decrease in value and then you can go in and jump in and then when he's six seven years down the road if he is this superstar in the face of mlb then you bought it in at a lower price you have these copies you've succeeded on your five-year plan and they may then start to appreciate slightly people like to argue it and it's sad but we are taking steps to being back in the late 80s, early 90s of, you know, if you want to choose it as junk wax. But uh, I think we both would agree the, the more pop or uh, way we would like to see it is just overproduced era. Um, none of it really is junk, but it's, <laughs> it is overproduced. Um, and I think we are following those same footsteps. You mentioned something, though, that I didn't think I didn't expect you to answer it that way. Uh, you mentioned the serial numbers and you said something below 100. Now, something I've thought of and I want to see if you ever think of it the same way. In the 90s, uh, Don Russ Elite is a great one off the top of my head. They were serial number, but they were out of 10,000. 10,000. Most of them. Yep. And we laugh at that today because it's like oh 10,000 copies they weren't that rare the truth was to hit one of those 10,000 was very difficult but why but why was it difficult to hit them because of the amount of production correct you know? right. <laughs> absolutely so here is my question because I don't know if you see it the same way or if I'm just like looking at it through a different lens but I, I've sat down and I've looked at some of these products today and, you know, Tops isn't immune to it. They're a little bit better than Panini, but they're, they're not forgiven on this either. No, but they're all dirty. Year, they're, they're, they're creating new parallels, new colors, new patterns, new mm -hmm. sets. They got like these Tops Chrome lights now and all this other stuff, right? Sure. Do you think we are in the same or I shouldn't say the same, but a similar age today to where in the 90s, that 10,000 copies was serial numbered. But today we are approaching that same 10,000 serial number. It's just these manufacturers have played tricks on us by chopping it up and making it different colors and different patterns. But overall, we still have that same... 10,000, it's just sure they do. fractionalized it. Yep, they sure did. And okay. that, that all has <laughs> to come into play. That all has to come into play with the way product is released, though, also, because, uh, you know, boxes are not released the way they were in, you know, in the 80s and the 90s. We went from 36 packs to, to 24 packs, you know, to, to eight 12, packs, something to, that, to, yeah. to, you know, to six packs. I mean, it, it's crazy you know what you know what and, the actual sports card market has turned into you know i 
I couldn't imagine opening up a box of, of wax right now and, and only opening up six to eight packs or even 10 packs. I mean, that, that would frustrate me. I, I'm like, you right. know, give me the, give me the 24, give me the 36. I, I and, need some and- time in this. I think that also plays into something that we've discussed in previous episodes with like, you know, you see a lot of times people go to to a retail store and they'll clear a shelf. But as you mentioned, you know, you go to the store and you buy a blaster and it has six packs in it. Well, you know, your odds to pull anything out of that one blaster with only six packs is a lot less if you're only opening those six packs. So let me get five blasters to where I'm getting 30 packs so I have a better opportunity and I don't have to go home and say, damn, I picked the wrong box off the shelf. I now have all five boxes that were on the shelf. So if there's nothing there, I know I didn't leave something, right? Sure. And when we, at the same token, as you mentioned, you know, they, there wasn't this, not only do we have all the different parallels and the colors and the patterns, but now you got, products within products you know panini's great for it and and tops is doing it now too with i said like the crop tops chrome white and you know all these different iterations of the same product and then you got blasters you got megas you got cellos you got all of these different things hangers um we used to get like rack packs or a jumbo pack or just your simple basic wax pack Mm -hmm. the other difference is it's more commonplace now because of the hits involved that folks are going to the store or their LCS and just buying a box or buying a case. Whereas before we would go buy a pack or two packs, you know? So it's funny that you say today, if you go buy a box and only has six packs in it, it would frustrate you. But really when we were growing up, we may not have even gotten six packs, but we knew our chances were just as well with those two packs of getting a guy that we wanted. Whereas today you spend, you know, I think blasters are like 30, 30, 40 bucks at the, at retail. Now it's crazy. You're likely not going to even come close to getting your value back. So, you know, and that's why I buy collections, you know, because I I need value. I need value in, in my collecting, you know, I, in my collecting life, I need value for my money. So, and value in my money means more cardboard, more chances for me to play with with stuff. And I don't care that I'm going through a box that that has five thousand commons in it. It gets me occupied time that where I get to play with my cards. I get to distract myself from whatever else is going on in life, and I'll you know, spend that 15, 20 minutes of breaking down a 5,000 count box and figuring out what I'm keeping and what's going away. But I I can't do that with today's product. You you, you just can't do it. I mean, there's an LCS in in Vegas that that I buy from quite regularly and and I buy volume from them. And um, for for them, I used to be able to buy 5,000 count boxes. and, And this is with general parallels being thrown in there and, and other inserts. They, I used to be able to buy them for 15 to $20 a box. Now I can't touch them for under 45 to $50 for a 5,000 count. They, they just can't, they can't do it because right. cost, the cost, cost of, the of entry, is so high. Yep. Yeah. Cost of entry is just way too much for them to start, you know, dumping that stuff, even though they're moving on to the new next product next week, they, they still got to try to recoup some of that that damage that they've absorbed along the way right um it's funny you say that too like as you know me and the missus love opening wax and it's been difficult because i as you have to buy it right now for the entertainment fact you know just just the pure enjoyment of opening the wax you cannot buy wax right now at all I i don't care what product it is you cannot buy any product out there and know that your odds to even come close to the value you spent on the product is going to be in return. And, and I'm, I'm saying that legitimately, whether it's the value of it today or even like a couple of years from now, we know that the production is so high, the risk of what you're spending versus the value that you're going to get back out of it. So you have to add in the entertainment value 100% today 
or you're just like you're gonna hate wax period uh, but here's a perfect yep. example i don't know soccer i don't know soccer at all but i mm. seen some soccer packs one day in 2019 and me and the missus opened them and uh it, it's a perfect example where i don't have to know who this dusan lehovich is but I knew contenders was a popular thing and it was his contenders rookie ticket. And I, so I sleeved it and top loaded it and stashed it in a box. I still today don't know who Dusan Lehovich is, but apparently he's become a pretty popular and, you know, a, a decent athlete in soccer. So um, sometimes it's okay. Like if you're buying a big 5,000 cal box, as you said, you might roll through there in two years from now. And there might be somebody that at the time of purchase was a nobody, but became a pretty good star. Um, just something because because we've eclipsed the 30 minute mark, but it's OK. Um, I wanted to bring this on um, as we started out and we didn't touch on it a lot. But I, so I want to close out on this. Um, we, we discussed a lot with the five year plan. And then that's when you will decide whether or not of whether a player is willing to have money be spent on for grading. Grading right now, it's hard to grade a lot of cards simply because of the cost of grading. You know, it, it I'm, I'm praying myself that grading goes down. I have lots of cards I would love to get graded. Yep. The question remains, and this was something on our topic list, and I, I would like it to be, you know, we can discuss on it for a few minutes. Um, why, even after that five-year plan, you know this player projected out how you liked, he's a great player. Why do you grade cards? For me, it's it's preservation of, of the card. If I, if he's reached that five-year plan for me, and I, and I know that he's going to be a superstar and a, or a Hall of Famer, I, then I'll start grading that stuff and it, it no longer needs to sit in a, in a top loader sitting in a box any, any longer. I'll, I'll go ahead, grade them out, stash them away. And of course those will be there for, for my kids when, when the time comes, because unfortunately they're not going to be able to know what everything is that I have, but they're going to be able to pick up a slab and go, okay, well, that's a PSA 10 89 upper deck Griffey rookie. Okay, let me look that up. Okay, this is what they're going for. Okay, well, this is what this person's offering me for. Them. So, you know, it, it just makes it easier. So for me, it's all about preservation because in my collection, everything that I have, it it, it has monetary value. It does. But I, I probably have 10,000 plus cards right now that are sitting that are waiting to get at the grading level so I can start grading. You know, but I can't because one grading is just way too expensive. You know how I feel about that whole thing. I, I was always a big PSA guy and, and it just killed me this year not to grade at, at the national. I had five grand set aside to, to grade at the national. I did not grade anything with, with PSA this year because I, I felt like I was being, you know, extorted a hundred bucks to join a collector's club to grade at the national. I'm a, you know, I'm a national kind of guy grader. I, I want that instant gratification. So I will pay the premium, but don't sit there and hit me with an extra hundred dollars on a collector's club, you know, membership that's basically worthless to me because I'm not going to grade out with you throughout the rest of the year. If they were offering right. more, if they were offering more grading opportunities at other shows, at other events, then I would say, Hey, yeah, it's, it's worth that hundred bucks. I'll throw away that hundred bucks. And then this way, if I go travel to, to Dallas, or if I go travel to, you know, to Burbank, if they start doing the, the Burbank show, which I know they're going to be there, but I, don't, I doubt that they'll be doing any kind of grading this time. But um, it, if they, they actually offered more opportunities to grade on site grading, then that hundred dollar value would mean something to me with, with PSA. But the way they did it this year, making you, sign up and and you had to have that in order to grade with them or your grading fees went up to four hundred dollars per card i just i walked away from it i took that five grand and then and i just went and bought other cardboard 
you know so for right. me i don't i don't have to grade to be happy i just have to have cardboard in my life to be happy right um and, and i think that's a very valid point and and honestly <laughs> it's funny you said that because you are a show grader and you said that you you mentioned that that instant gratification of, of getting the car graded right there at the show. The funny part is I'm actually the opposite. And this was obviously my first national. And I, I, I can't believe I've never attended a national before because I, I had an absolute blast. Um, just the people alone, like we didn't even have to have the cards there. Just the people alone made that show worth the trip. Sure it did. Absolutely. I was the one that had the mindset of, I don't ever see myself grading a card at a show. Like, I just don't see that. And it never, like, processed to me. And I'm the one that actually got a card graded at the show. And that was the funny part, because, like, I went into that show with zero intentions of having a card graded there. Um, and as most everyone knows, if, if they followed along or about myself, but... My history with engrading, um, I, I was always just a raw card collector until 2017 when I started building that national set that I that I spoke on in an earlier episode. I never I never bought graded cards. I never graded cards. I, I didn't care about the grading aspect. I just enjoyed the cards and collecting the cards, whether it be binder, top loaders, whatever. Yeah. Um, and then in 2017 when I got into doing that national thing and I wanted to have a theme going with it. And they was, you know, I, I started looking into the grading, the graded cards and stuff. Um, it got me more interested in it. And then obviously I've mentioned, you know, I, I don't really get a lot. I can't, I, I have a, I know players to buy, but I can't ever talk myself into spending money with the intent of immediately flipping a card like when i'm on ebay looking for cards to buy or at a show looking for cards to buy i'm looking for cards that i want in my collection um a card that i've been wanting to, to knock off my list or whatever so it's hard for me to process looking for something specifically with the sole intent of just almost immediately selling it afterwards so grading never was a thing to me but i did start i'll tell you what actually got me into looking at it was two things. One, when the missus pulled the Fernando Tatis red refractor, you know, from Topps Chrome 2019. That I knew was a big card. I would, at by that time, I knew more about grading. As you said, I knew it would preserve it. It would say what the conditional aspect of it was, and it would be encapsulated. The other one was 2018 Prism. We pulled a Luka Doncic Silver. Uh, I noticed what that card sold for raw. He wasn't a player I was intending on keeping. In fact, full disclosure, we bought Prism because I knew it was a product and basketball was hot back then um, that you were almost unable to lose money on. So it was a form of being able to have fun, enjoy cards, but also have a profit potential to be able to use money to buy other things in my collection. So that's what introduced me to getting into getting cards graded. But the more I've done that, and with the change over specifically the last two years, um, I've also now resorted to more just grading cards for my collection than even worrying about grading cards to sell anymore. Um, so things have changed and shifted, and I've adapted and looked at different things. But my point is, over the course of time, I've only used PSA for one order and you know i'm not poo-pooing on psa i have my reason that i didn't care for the service and i moved <coughs> on it might be another reason why like you're specifically show grader so you appreciate the show process that that satisfaction of having it done me the process of shipping them off and it took forever and i paid up and all this other stuff and it the the product that was advertised wasn't the product i really you know the 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 service i got provided so that led and me let, to searching let me cut you off right there and and that's why i have the problem with the collector's club the whole process of that of, you know of being a member of that it there's nothing about that that appeals anything to me it's it's just there's too many negatives in there 
unfortunately, and and PSA is at fault for that. So you know, unless PSA cleans that up, they lose people like you, they lose people like me, and you know they don't get these new people that come in. Sure, they're going to get those new people that are going to come into the into the hobby, and they're going to go, okay, I have to grade with PSA because PSA gets me the you know the, the they almighty want, dollar. Right, that are wanting to maximize value. Yeah. Okay, I have yeah. to I have to grade with that. Okay, fine. Right. You, go ahead. Soon enough, they learn real quick that it's it's the same old thing. It's the same old issues. So for me to grade at the national, at, because that's where I'm always going to grade at, is I'm I'm grading cards that have minimum of a thousand to five thousand value in in that ballpark range. Otherwise, I'm not grading at the national because it's not worth it to me. But right again, you, you know, that whole hundred dollar fee that they're hitting you with forcing you to join their, their collector's club. I, I thought that was just, it, that was real sour for me this year. And everybody made a stink. Well, they're, they're only $18. No, they were, they were taking grades back home at $18. Mm -hmm. Actually, they weren't even taking them home. They were probably leaving them there in, in Jersey anyway, you know. Right. that that eighteen dollar whole grading process didn't it just didn't interest me at all it, because of course i didn't get that instant gratification i need that instant gratification because if i'm spending right. that kind of money i i want to grade big cards and well and of course i'm not there to sell them anyway so i'm they're coming home the the other side and and, and you you know I, I see certain points to the membership club if it's for mail-in purposes. But you at the show, I agree. Yeah. You shouldn't have needed that collector's club membership because it didn't benefit you what the purpose of that club is to begin with. And something, you know, I, I've spoke on the, the customer service side of things and my whole experience when I tried PSA out. Uh, some things I haven't ever touched on, but, uh, you know, I'll share it here right now uh, that I have issues with. And I didn't bring I never made a big stink about it. But you brought up the collector's club when I signed up to use PSA before I knew how things were going to flow out. I actually signed up for the platinum membership because it made the most sense. You got the 15 vouchers that kind of offset the cost. And, you know, it was a year membership and my intent was to do bulk subs with them, you know, my own personal stuff or what have you. But that was in uh, and I, I believe I shared this information with you off off air here. But I, I want to say it was like October of 2019 or something like that. And as we know, the pandemic hit and PSA shut down. Well, mm -hmm. I didn't never make a big stink about it, but I couldn't even use the membership I paid for because they weren't even open or accepting submissions, but yet my membership was never extended. Like I have it in my account that shows yeah. my, my sign up date, you know, was obviously when I sent the cards in like maybe the day before or whatever. And then it shows my expiration date. I was never offered an extension. I, I never got an extension. I got a one-year subscription to a membership that I wasn't even capable of using for that one year. And outside of the fact, and this was just another pet peeve, oh. and believe me, I know no company is perfect. Again, I am not poo-pooing on them. But I do rather a company, and there is other folks outside of here that have been grading cards way longer than I have that also has made these same statements. Their grading sometimes is too inconsistent. And in that one submission I sent, I sent a card in intentionally thinking it was going to get no better than a nine, potentially an eight. And I sent it on purpose to see. The Lucas Silver that I was speaking on, I thought 100% certain that was a 10. And I'm not saying this because, oh my God, you know, it's back fresh. I actually looked the cards over. I researched videos. I looked at, you know, what do you need to check on cards? Like, I didn't just dive into grading thinking I knew everything. I actually sat and <laughs> reviewed these cards over. I, that's why the one card I expected an eight or a nine, because it had a bad surface dimple in it, etc. Well, when I got the Luca back, it was a nine. 
And when I got the other card was a DeAndre Ayton silver, and it got a 10. And I was expecting an 8, maybe a 9 on the Ayton, and it gets the 10. And I'm expecting a 10 on the Luka, and it gets a 9. I'm just like, okay. I, I don't know you, what you to don't, say you don't right think now. <laughs> What's that? You, you don't think pop control hit you, did you? I said, you don't think pop control hit you, did you? It wasn't a matter of pop control. To be honest with you, I think it was because I used my vouchers, and I think the declared value came into play because I actually went yep. with the SMR value, which at the time on a Lucas Silver was, I believe, $400. And... I yep. think they said, okay, well, if this guy's the DV, you know, his declared value, if he's only putting it at 400 bucks, well, that's what eBay value is saying for a nine. So we're just going to give him the nine. Um, I honestly yep. believe that could have been some of what happened. And I wasn't trying to play the system. I was new to it. And they even stated in their site, I, I don't remember specifically where it was, but it says you could use SMR, you know, the, the what is it, uh, Sports Market Report or something like that, their magazine. And it showed PSA 10 Luca Silvers were $400 in there. That's what I went off of. Um, and, and that got me into allowing to submit that card, obviously, at the, the voucher level. But I do wonder if that isn't why it got the nine instead of the 10, because Otherwise, the card was great. So, um, but yeah, that, that was another issue that I had with their service and why I just, you know, I, I looked elsewhere. Um, I did do research on other companies, um, watching other people's videos. And uh, obviously, Beckett prices were higher than I wanted to pay for what I had intent of doing with grading. And um, SGC was there, a great option. Things have changed in today's landscape. Obviously, grading in general across the board is more expensive. Uh, so it is harder to uh, justify many cards being sent in to be graded. Uh, I hope things change soon um, in that aspect with across all of the companies, not just one company in specific. I hope they all adjust their pricing soon. Um, for everybody, whether you know you're you're sending to collect, whether you're sending because you look at this as a business aspect and you want to maximize value, um, but I, I just hope things start to come back to normal um, now that you know it, it looks like PSA is going to be rolling along with something that hasn't happened for a very long time, uh, and and that would be no backlog. Uh, Beckett is seeming to rebrand, and we also have a fourth company in the mix now uh, which would be csg so really if you look at terms um where grading as a whole is uh, in an aspect of the landscape of the current hobby i think we're in a better position than we were even pre-pandemic because we do have four companies psa is going to clear a backlog out so they're going to be kind of fresh and they're going to have two offices so um, that's just kind of my feel on it. Um, so I, I do hope that all of the companies uh, decrease their, their, their costs soon. Um, I do completely agree with you. I don't see the need for a membership if you're at a show grading. Um, I, the card I got graded there uh, was simply because I just wanted it authenticated and in the slab. To speak on the topic of why I grade cards, a lot of it is what we had discussed in a previous episode. When I hand these cards down, you actually uh, spoke on it with the, the label tells your kids what the card is, what the condition is. There's no questioning it. They, they can't be debated of what they have. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at as well. I want everything to, you know, be known that it's authentic, uh, what the card is, what the condition is. And um, there's there's no questions about it. Plus, I love displaying my cards and enjoying them. And having them in a slab gives a nice, uh, you know, you, you use the term preservation. Um, it, but it gives it a nice uh, aesthetically pleasing, um, you know, holder to, to display the cards, to enjoy them. And uh, again tells what they are, tells the conditional value of them. 
And um, yeah, that that's something I love. I think it's an extension of our hobby. And uh, there's nothing wrong with grading for any uh, any route that you use it for. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, we covered two great topics with the five-year plan and grading. Uh, do you have anything yep. to wrap us up on? Any final thoughts on that five-year plan, uh, on grading in general, you know, pricing, turnarounds, any of that stuff, the future of grading, um, just to close us out on? Any final thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think the future of grading it, is going to evolve, of course, with the way we all as hobbyists evolve in, in our collecting. If we continue to just pour anything into a grading company, they have no incentive to drop the prices. So if we start being more selective as to what we start grading and enjoy, and and, and I understand the flipping aspect of it, and that's why a lot of people will still you know, submit a ton of cards just to, to be able to turn that dollar. But it, the sooner that we can basically monopolize the market to our favor as a collector and say, hey, you know what? I'm not sending you 100 cards anymore. I'm going to send you 25 cards. Eventually, they're going to have to bring down the, the cost of grading. No matter what, they're going to have to because they one they got to pay their overhead do they have to pay those pay those employees and three if they're not turning out product and product is not going out on the market they don't get that market rec recognition out there and they're not being shown as being a high value grade you know grading company in the eyes of of the hobbyists so i, I you know i'd I say not to interrupt um but I, I think you're spot on with that. And this is something that I've even, you know, I, I've used SGC since I started using them for every card, but three cards I've graded. And the truth is something I feel that is very, very, very overlooked within the hobby. And, and you kind of just alluded to it. People key in or, and they're so hyper-focused on that resale value, right? It's got to be, you know, PSA for this resale value, but there's resale value within the other slabs, except everybody ignores the fact that we are consumers at the end of the day. This is a hobby, but we are consumers and it all eludes back to resale value is what's focused on, but cost to obtain or cost to grade comes into play on whether or not that resale value is even profitable. And with grading fees higher, even for people that if they are only grading cards to sell, that cost to grade has to come into play. You know, everybody knows that every card they send in is a 10, but at the end of the day, it's probably maybe 25% that are actually getting 10s, right? Gem rates across the board um, and, and with more production comes more flaws, which comes less gem rates. So mm -hmm. when you have a higher expense, lower grades, you're creating higher losses. And then you toss in what we also discussed with wax prices, you know, boxes being so expensive. The overall cost to obtain a product in a final graded form copy is becoming very expensive, but yet the value of it is decreasing because there's so much more of it on the market. So I think you're spot on. I personally... I send cards almost every single order we do. I have felt weird because the last two orders we sent, I did not include any cards. And it's not because I don't have cards that I want in my collection graded or, you know, encapsulated, I should say. I don't even really care what the grades are on some stuff. But I like them in that 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 holder. But I, before I lost you, I was kind of saying I could hang a photo up on the wall, right? But it doesn't mean I need to go to a professional framer and spend $100 on a frame to enjoy that photo. I can go to Walmart and get an, a, another frame that looks nice for maybe 20 bucks, right? So it's all in, are you doing this because of the presentation? Are you doing it because of the cost? Are you doing it because of the resale value? What is your intent behind it? And I think many folks... You know, and it's overlooked. They do grading as an extension of their hobby. 
They do it because they like the card presented in a holder. But when it becomes too expensive, they'll either A, find or adapt to a different company that's offering a cheaper price, or they'll just stop using the service until it becomes affordable again. I have, you've seen all the Griffies I bought. I would love my Griffy collection to be slapped. I can't afford that right now. So they sit in a in one of my many boxes in top loaders until things potentially change and I find it affordable because the realistic nature is in a lot of those 90s inserts and the die cuts and everything else, I'm likely only going to get like an eight or a nine at best anyway. Yeah. And at the current cost of grading, it it's not like I'm spending money for a fancy holder essentially. So yep, uh, I, I, I've, I completely I've, agree I've always, with you. Yeah. I've always been that PSA nine kind of guy. You know, everybody loves the PSA 10. I've always, I, I've always, always, always been satisfied with a PSA nine. Isn't because it? Because a, a lot of nines just look just like a 10 to me. So, it, I, and, it, and I've seen a lot of eights that should have been tens. So, you know, it, of course it's so subjective. So I'm happy at that nine level. I, I think I think that is a perfect spot to close us out. And you just said something that I think we will will use for fuel for a future episode, uh, because as, especially as somebody that does bulk submissions, and I hear people all the time talking about what they thought their cards were going to get, especially when they're selling them. You brought up a point that I always, always, always laugh at. And so I think we're going to uh, we'll, we'll end here. That's a great place to end. And uh, we'll use that for a fuel for a further episode. But thank you all for tuning in. I hope you have enjoyed this. I uh, hope you have a wonderful evening or day. Fuel, um, fuel to the fire. Yes, sir. Um, but thank you for tuning in and have a wonderful day.